Good morning. It's great to be here with uh, to be here with you this morning. Last time I was up here um, was the beginning of January. And nobody was here with me, so it's good. It's good to see y'all out there. Uh, I am excited uh, because I get to share God's word with you this morning. And uh, before we jump into that, I want to let's. Go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have much to give thanks for. One of those things that we are most thankful thankful for is for the gift of your holy word. And as we open your word today, please, Lord, open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have for us today. Amen. Have you ever heard of the board game Clue? Um, it's this one right here. Uh, I know it's a, it's a little bit older game. came out in the 1940s. But growing up, it was one of my favorite games to play. And uh, for those of you that don't know what it's about, it's a murder mystery game. Uh, the objective of the game is to solve a murder. And you start out by selecting uh, who you're going to be. And there's all these characters down here. My favorite was Mr. Green and Professor Plum. The one I never wanted to get was Colonel Mustard. Or <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was really fun. Um, the board is set up like a house or a mansion, and you roll the dice and you move your character from room to room, and you have to figure out who the murderer was, what uh, they used. There's like nine different weapons that you could. Uh, that they had, and then um, then which room, what room was the murder um, committed in? And so you're going from room to room, and when you're in a room, you can make guesses, and through the process of elimination, uh, or you're f- trying to pick out these clues, and through the process of el- uh, elimination, you f- figure out what or who the murderer was, what weapon they used, what room it was in, um, at least that's how you won the game. Uh, it's a fairly simple game, but it's extremely fun. And I brought it up here because this week, uh, when I felt like I was playing a game of Clue uh, in preparing for this morning's message, uh, because we are going back to Matthew 21, 1 through 11, uh, again this week, because there is a second clue that I'd like to share with you this morning. And uh, if you're new with us, this morning, or missed last week, we started our new series that is going to take us all the way up to Easter called Christ Clues. Throughout this series, we are looking at clues that God has given us, that, that he is showing us that he loves us, that he cares for you, cares for you deeply, that he wants a relationship with you. And, and as we move each week toward Easter... We will, we will be reminded each week that these, all these clues point to one answer. Spoiler alert, that answer is Jesus. So today, will you join me in playing a game of Clue? I've already given you the big answer, but I want to go ahead and tell you the clue that points us to Jesus this morning. And today's clue is is that we are in need of a Savior. We are in need of salvation. Let's read Matthew 21, 1 through 11 together. And I'm in the ESV. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, their, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. 
Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered into Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now last week, Kurt spoke on this passage, and he spoke specifically on the prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 and how Christ fulfilled that prophecy by writing in on a cult. And if you missed that message, it's a good one, so I would make sure to go back and watch it. Plus, you don't want to miss any clues. This week, however, we are going to be focusing on the later portion of that section of Scripture, and we're going to be focusing primarily on the reaction of the crowd and their response to Jesus. We see that on Jesus' approach to Jerusalem, the crowd cheered for him, offered up praise to him. They laid their cloaks out on the road and waved palm branches. Reading this passage, one would think that they were ready to crown Jesus king. After all, they were recognizing him as Messiah. They were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Oh, save us. The son of David is a, a common way of referring to the Messiah. But we know that that isn't what happened. Because less than a week later, these same people that were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, are found a few days later crying out for Jesus' crucifixion. Crucify him. I've got three things that we're going to be ta taking a look at today. First is that we offer up praise based on our expectation. Second is that we are fickle with our praise when our expectation is not met. Third is that our expectations lead to destruction. These three things will lead us to our clue that we need a savior, that we need salvation. So let's dive into that first point that we offer up our praise based on our expectation. If we look at verse 8 through 11, it's pretty easy to see that Jesus was being praised and lifted up by the people on his entrance to Jerusalem. In fact, you probably have a nice title over this section of scripture called the triumphant entry or the triumphal entry. I want you to picture this because I don't think we as 21st century Christians, we as 21st century believers have the right picture. It's Passover in Israel, and the law, and by law, Passover is to be celebrated in Jerusalem. Every family was to send a Paschal lamb to be sacrificed at the temple. And according to the famous Jewish historian at the time, Josephus, he estimates around 500 to 600,000 people normally lived in Jerusalem around that time. And we see this because he records this as the Rome comes in to destroy Jerusalem. Jerusalem about 40 years later, he's recording how many people live there. So it's probably around that same number. However, around the Passover, that would balloon to 2.5 to 3 million people. And we know this because Josephus records that approximately 260,000 lambs were sacrificed at the temple with an average of about 10 people per lamb and including people that showed up but were considered unclean and, and legally were not allowed to make a sacrifice. It comes out to be somewhere between 2.5 to 3 million people. Now, let's put this into perspective. Let's put this into perspective of 2020. 
Dallas County, not the city, Dallas County, which includes Rowlett, estimates that there are around 2.6 million people in Dallas County. That's a lot of people. That's like fitting the entirety of Dallas County into a tiny city called Jerusalem. Now that we have a little better better picture in our head, we see that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, into a city that is literally bursting at the seams. As he's entering into the city, he's probably passing through tent cities. He's probably passing people going in and out of the city. Many of these people are probably familiar with his ministry because of his traveling. And they are pilgrims coming to Jerusalem. So they are coming from the countryside where he did the majority of his ministry. Some of them have maybe even seen him teach before or been there when he performed some of his miracles. And as they see him approach, they recognize him and begin to show him honor and praise by laying down their cloaks and breaking off branches and waving them at him and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, calling him son of David, which, as I discussed earlier, which is well known as a way of describing the Messiah. This this reaction of the crowd, this this calling out Hosanna and, and calling him the Messiah created such an uproar that Matthew records that the entire city was stirred. And we just heard that that's about 2.6 million people. The entire city was stirred up saying, who is this? Let's talk about why these people were praising Jesus. It's because they had an expectation of Jesus. And we see this expectation in their crying out of Hosanna. Hosanna is a Hebrew term which is not found in in the Greek or or in the English. What we've done is literally in the Greek when they ran across the term Hosanna, they just transliterated it, which just means they took the syllables or the sounds and they put it in their language. And essentially, we did that same thing. Hosanna is a Hebrew term that is, that is found in Psalm 118.25. So as they are, they are, they are literally crying out this psalm, Psalm 118.25, as they see Christ approaching Jerusalem. And Psalm 118.25 says this, Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray, give us success. Hosanna means to save. It's a, liter- it's a crying out, save me, O Lord. It is both a praise and a pleading to God. So when, the, when we see the crowd crying out, Hosanna to the Son of God, Hosanna in the highest, they are crying out, save us, Jesus, the Messiah. Save us, Most High, with the latter referring to God. And they're crying out, they had an expectation of what that salvation would look like. They were a nation under occupation from a foreign government, and at the time, Israel and Jerusalem were under the control of Rome. When they saw Jesus, what they were expecting was a person, a king, that would rally a nation and expel the Romans and set up a new kingdom. And we know this because this is what the disciples expected. If we look back just one chapter before in in Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28, or you can go over to Mark 10, verses 35 to 45, right? You see, Jesus, who is predicting his death for a third time, right after this, uh, we see James and John come up to Jesus and ask to be on his right and left hand in glory. Now, what they thought when, when they said glory, what they thought was that when Christ kicked out Rome and set up his new kingdom, let us 
sit at your right and left hand. Now, it also says that we we see the other ten disciples, they were indignant when they had heard that James and John had asked for these places of honors. And I, I love I love it how how it uses the word indignant because it's such a great word. Because they were they were not indignant because they didn't think John, James and John were should have those positions, but they were they were frustrated because they didn't get the opportunity to ask first. It shows that that all 12 disciples had this expectation that Jesus was going to come and rescue Israel out from Rome and set up his new kingdom. We also see that that this understanding um, or this fear was actually what motivated uh, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees had this understanding because when we look at John eleven forty eight 48 through 50, the Pharisees are having a conversation about plotting to kill Jesus. And I love this perspective from Dwight Pentecost. He has a book called The Words and Works of Jesus Christ. And he has this perspective on this passage. He says, they, the, the Pharisees, reasoned that if Israel accepted Jesus as the Messiah and he instituted a kingdom, Rome would move in and destroy the rival kingdom. It seemed better to the Jewish leaders that one man should die than that the whole nation should perish at the hands of Rome. What an interesting perspective because they have it backwards. You see, the disciples, the crowds, the multitudes, even the Pharisees had an expectation of Jesus. That if Jesus was the Messiah, that he would challenge Rome and establish a new kingdom. And because, because of this expectation, that is why they praised him. When they lifted up their voices and cried out, Hosanna, save us, O Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are lifting up praise based on this expectation. However, we know that this is not the reason Jesus came. And that, because that is not the reason that Jesus came, their praise quickly turns. And so we see that we are fickle with our praise when our expectation is not met. I mentioned it before, but you really can't read this passage of Scripture without thinking, what happened? How did the crowds go from Hosanna to the Son of God, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him? We see in Matthew 27, 23, crucify him. And as I was preparing my message this week, I ran across this song by Shane and Shane, Christian artist called Crucify Him. And I want us to take a moment and actually listen to it. To those of you that are online or maybe you're catching this later on our podcast or another format, I'm going to encourage you to pull up your phone or your device and, and, and look it up real fast. Shane and Shane, crucify him. Because we're going to have to mute the live stream uh, because of potential copyright issues. And um, so we will be, if you're watching it online, we're going to mute it for about two and a half minutes, maybe three. And we'll be right back with you. Read those lyrics. I sing Hosanna when I want it all. Then I crucify the Son of God because he isn't who I always thought. Not what I want, but what I needed. I sing how great and mighty is the King just as long as he considers me high above every other thing, even his glory. Broke, broken like a record, spinning round and round, like a hurricane 
I pour out water, then I disappear, reappearing when I fear enough or need a touch from you. I sing Hosanna once again, then I say, crucify him. Doesn't that hit you to the core? I know it does me. Broken like a record, spinning round and round. That's exactly what happens to us. It's exactly what is happening here when we see the Israelites one day crying out, Save us, O Lord, Messiah. And then the next crying out for Jesus' crucifixion. If you are familiar with scripture, you see this pattern repeated again and again and again and again in the life of Israel. And I could go on with a lot of agains. Not only do we see this as a pattern in the life of Israel, but we see it, I see it in a pattern in my own life. We, I see it in a pattern in our lives where I see how great and might Mighty is the king just as long as he considers me high above every other thing, even his own glory. The, their expectation was that Jesus was going to come in, come in in might and remove the Roman Empire, establish his kingdom despite everything he had been telling them. So I want to I want us to move over to the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Jesus is arrested. And I've got to be wondering that when the soldiers, the Roman soldiers show up to arrest Jesus, that the, the disciples were probably thinking in their mind, this is it. This is how it begins. We even see Simon Peter in John 18.10, draw his sword and cut off one of the ears of a slave. And I think John is calling Peter out. And the other three gospels that record this, they're very gracious and just say one of the disciples. Could have probably been any of them. But Peter, Peter's like, this is it. It's happening. I'm going to, We're to start in the revolution. But instead, Jesus, instead of joining in, tells Peter, put away your sword. And so Peter might have been thinking at that moment, okay, you're the Messiah. Maybe you'll just strike them all down and and no fight needed. But instead, Jesus does the unthinkable. He does the unthinkable in their minds. Because it doesn't meet their expectation. He submits and is arrested. And you've got to be thinking that, that maybe this is where a little doubt, a little bit of fickleness starts to creep in in the disciples' minds. After all, we see Peter, right after this, he goes on to deny Christ three times. In, in our own lives, we do this with our praise. The last song we, we sung right before here, we, we said, I pour out our praise, or we pour out our praise to you only. And, and as we were singing that, I couldn't help to think, man, if that was only true. Because we pour out our praise on a lot of things. A lot of idols, a lot of small g gods that we put in front of God, in front of Christ. We put expectations on Christ. We put expectations on God. We play, place ourselves over him. And, and we, when we sing, we sing his praise as long as he puts us above all, even his own glory. I think back to some of the prayers that I've prayed, and maybe you'll rem- relate to this. I'm sure that you've prayed some as well. I remember as a kid growing up, being in a close baseball game, in a tournament that I really wanted to win, praying to God, please let us win. 
please let me get this hit. Or later in life, last week I got to share a little bit of my life story last, uh, last Sunday night. Um, praying that, that God would let me continue in a career path. That clearly God was saying that, hey, that's not what I want for you. But, but only offering, I would praise him only if he did this for me. As if, as if he had not done something for me by sending his son to rescue from, my, from me from my sins and death that, that wasn't already enough for me to praise him for the rest of my life and for all eternity. Now, now hear me out. I'm not saying that crying out to God and praying for things that you want or need is wrong. In fact, Scripture says that in God, that God will give us the desires of our heart. And in Psalm 37, 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And in, in Philippians 4, 19, we see it that says, and God will supply all your needs according to his riches and the glory of Christ Jesus. But when you read that, you see a little stipulation there. In, in Psalm 37, it says, He will give you all the desires of your heart, but delight yourself in the Lord. What does that mean? What, is, what does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? Well, I'll tell you, if you're delighting yourself in the Lord, your desires will be what God desires, and therefore He will give you the desires of your heart. God will supply all your needs through the riches and glory of Christ Jesus. We love to put ourselves on the throne that is reserved for Christ alone. We love to elevate our wants and needs and expectations above him and his work. And as soon as something goes wrong or doesn't go at work or in our marriage or in our life, we cry, crucify him. This reminds me of a little story of, of Job. Job is one of my favorite books in the Bible because of what we're about to look at. And if you haven't read Job, I'll give you a brief synopsis. Job is a story of a righteous man that was put through trials. It's about as brief as you get. He was put through a lot, a lot of trials. And in chapter 7, we find, we find Job crying out to God, asking the question, why? Why am I your target? Why do you not pardon my transgressions? In a sense, Job, I almost did it, did it again. Job, first service I said Job. Got to laugh at yourself. In a sense, Job is putting an expectation on God. Now, we have to wait 31 chapters to hear God's response, but it's a really good one. God looks at Job and says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When, when Job asked the question why, that's God's response. And otherwise, he is saying, who are you to put your expectation on me? We see Christ respond to the, the multitude's expectation in Luke 19, uh, in 1941. As Christ is going up to Jerusalem and people are crying out, Hosanna. Christ knows what their expectation is. He see, and, and as he's approaching Jerusalem, hearing this, knowing the expectation, he 
Jerusalem comes into view and he begins to cry, to weep. And Luke 19, 41 through 44 says this. It says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace. But now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Pentecost says this in, in the same book. He says, he has this perspective on it. says, Luke was so sensitive to the heart of the Son of Man that he alone recorded Christ's response as he approached the city of Jerusalem. It seems as though Christ's ears were deaf to the hosannas of the multitude. For instead of seeing the momentary recognition of his person, He saw rather the rejection of his person by the nation. And it moved him to tears and he wept. I believe not not only was he weeping over the fact that his rejection was imminent, but also what that rejection would cost him. And that it would also ultimately lead to Jerusalem's destruction. And so we see that our expectation leads to destruction. From the very beginning of time, we see this. When we place our expectation over God, over God, over him, if we place expectation on him, We see this even from the very beginning. All you have to do is look back at Genesis 3 to see that our expectations lead to destruction. Literally, from the beginning of time, we see this with Adam seeking to be like God in eating the fruit. He solidified our need for a future Savior because just as Adam's expectation led the entire human race into death. Israel's expectation on Jesus led them to crucify the one who had come to bring them peace. And through crucifying the one who would bring them peace, it led to the destruction of not only Jerusalem, but also the temple. And so every time we place our expectation on God and we choose not to praise him for who he is because he is worthy of our praise, we walk down that path of destruction. And we know that it is a path of destruction because in Romans 6, 23, uh, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in Romans 3, 23 through 25, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly. And if you know, in in Jesus' ministry, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem is, is his first time publicly being declared the Messiah. We see even the, the Pharisees even tell him to stop, tell your followers to stop crying out Hosanna and calling him Messiah. And he says, hey, if they don't do it, the stones will do it. And so we see him being displayed publicly. Clue after clue is given to us that we are in need of a Savior. Hosanna. Save me, O Lord. We need a Savior. 
However, we place ourselves above God and praise him when he is doing the things we want, when we want them, and how we want them done. And when things don't happen our way, we are fickle with our praise. And we call out, crucify him. Because God is not meeting our expectations. And our expectations lead us down a path of destruction. I've got two applications for you this morning. First, and I know there are some in here, that if you have not come to know Christ as your Savior, you need to. Whatever is holding you back, from taking that step, it's not worth it. Whatever expectation you have on God, placing expectations on God, we've seen never ends well. Because Jesus came on a donkey in peace to bring peace, to restore our relationship to him, to give us the free gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord to bring us, to, be, to, to allow us to be justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Whatever expectation that is holding you back from taking that step, let go of it. Because he came in peace on it, riding on a donkey this time. But scripture says the next time he comes, it's going to be on a war horse to judge the world. And then it'll be too late. If you want to know how to begin your relationship with Jesus, I've got one word for you. Hosanna. Save me, O Lord. Cry that out. And scripture says that he is faithful to save you. If you want to know more and, or help, Pastor Kurt would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. Come and find one of us. But don't delay. And if you're a believer this morning, this message was for you too. Because we too place expectations on God. We too lift up praise to him and put ourselves on the throne. And I'm I'm going to encourage you that this week I want you to take some time and pray that God will shine a light on the ways that are holding back that are holding you back in your praise to him. Because of the expectations that you've put on him. Let's pray.